So this is Alisa. I am moderating our time together. And I think I'll just give it maybe another minute while maybe some took just a chance for a, a small break <laughs> and then join us and look forward to our time together. So we'll, we'll get started here in another minute. And then just quickly, because Brittany, I really don't want to start off on a wrong foot here in mispronouncing your last name. So can you please just share that with me so I don't do that. Yes. Are you able to hear me? I am. Great. Okay. It is Brittany Okada. Okada. That's what I thought, but that would just be, no. especially in light of what the topic is. Thank you for, uh, hey, by the way, those are great remarks. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Perfect. All right. Well, I will get us started. And uh, welcome to those who have chosen this particular breakout. I, like Sarah had said, a difficult choice, lots of very interesting and important topics to cover today. And really look forward to our discussion. Just quickly, some housekeeping. We are recording this session. I ask that everyone mute themselves, otherwise I will take it upon myself to do that. Um, I, Unless, of course, you're asking a question uh, in a future point in time in our time together, any discussion. And then as well, just quickly introduce myself. So Elisa Soulier, I serve on the Get Healthy Utah board and I work within health promotion and wellness under community-based care at Intermountain Healthcare. And as you can imagine, it's a privilege for me to serve on the Get Healthy Utah, Utah board, connect with stakeholders like yourselves in this shared work that we all are so focused on even more so now in light of a world post understanding within a pandemic of the many challenges that have become further crystallized for us in improving the health of all these members in our various communities that we serve. And so for today, a topic that I think as I was reflecting you know, at Intermountain, we've actually included equity now as one of our new fundamentals. That's how much we've elevated the importance of this work. So it's at top of mind for everyone. But I do think, and I'll just speak for myself personally, not make presumptions for all. It can be challenging to be more introspective within yourself of this idea of it's one thing to do things differently. It's another to think differently. And sometimes it can be maybe easier to think about what are the systemic changes that are needed uh, because we can separate some personal <laughs> from that. Um, but that can also create some paralysis because it can be such a large problem to wrap our hands around. So I think we're in really expert hands today and look forward to learning more about how to cultivate and develop in equity mindset. And so again, Brittany Okada, I will just pull up um, and introduce her. So she is a senior health equity specialist and evaluator epidemiologist for the Utah Department of Health Office of Health Disparities. She coordinates projects with systems and communities aimed at advancing health equity she graduated from the University of Utah School of Medicine with a master's degree in public health. Her experience in public health practice and health equity work has involved community-based participatory research, maternal and child health, oral health, and access to care in Utah, Washington, DC, Cambodia, and South Korea. So Brittany, I very much look forward to turning this time over to you now. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and I'm so glad to see that, you know, we have 34 plus participants join this breakout group. We know everyone could self-select. So I was a little nervous about um, what our numbers would be, but I'm so grateful, um, whether it's big or small, that you chose um, to be here 
um, in a session about health equity. Um, and that's because we really do need anyone who is interested in health equity work to be here and to work with us in order to advance it. So I want, because you're here, I want to connect with you. Um, so please introduce yourself in the chat. Um, you can drop your name, your email address, um, why you are interested in health equity, what health equity means to you. I just, I want to connect with you just by the fact that you're interested in health equity that says something about you. Um, so today we're going to be um, laying a context for health equity in Utah and going over um, a health equity framework that our office, the Office of Health Disparities developed. Um, so please just enter questions into the chat. Um, I'll try to get to them as we can. I'm not so familiar with Zoom and presenting, so I'll, I'll please be patient with me as I try to navigate that. Um, but also just a heads up that we will be having a discussion a little bit later about where you see yourself and your work in the health equity framework. Um, and so just as I present it, be thinking of that so that we can have a good and rich discussion. So um, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to try and share my screen. So please be patient with me as I try to, to do that. Um, let's see. Okay, is everyone able to see my screen? Okay, I'm seeing some nods. I cannot see the chat, so I apologize. I won't be able to answer questions in the chat while I'm in presenting mode. Um, okay, so let's get started. So we're gonna start with COVID-19 and health disparities. Wow. Um, so as the COVID-19 pandemic spread to Utah last year, 2020, dare I say it, you know, um, we began to really see um, racial and ethnic communities shoulder some of the heaviest burdens of COVID-19. Infection, hospitalization, economic distress, and death, which was mirroring national trends. You know, our rural communities and lower socioeconomic status um, families and communities were experiencing higher risk, facing geographic isolation, chronic disease burden, um, limited access to resources and support. COVID-19 really did put a magnifying glass on health disparities in Utah. Um, so just so we're all on the same page about health disparities, health disparities are more than poor health outcomes. That's how we define them in Utah. And although all um, health disparities are poor health outcomes, not all poor health outcomes are health disparities. And I'm gonna say that one more time. Not all poor health outcomes are health disparities. A disparity implies that the difference is avoidable, unfair, and unjust, and that it's linked to economic, sociocultural, environmental, and geographic disadvantage. So COVID-19 exacerbated existing health disparities. It exposed health inequities, and it really demanded a focus on advancing health equity overall in Utah. It showed us how connected we really are, and that what happens to some of us really happens to all of us. So to some of us, this was really surprising. It kind of caught us on our heels. Um, to some of us, sadly, we saw this coming. Um, but what's most important now is that many of us or most of us can see and agree that we need to build better infrastructure systems um, and capacity focused on addressing health disparities and health equity in Utah. So just so we're all again on the same page about health equity and how we define it in Utah. Health equity is the principle behind the commitment to pursue the highest possible standard of health for all, while focusing on those with the greatest obstacles. So you saw this um, picture earlier. So a key 
part of focusing on health equity is being able to distinguish between equality and equity. Equality is the same for all, um, while equity really focuses on meeting a variety of needs. And our goal is to focus on equity and providing support to those with the greatest obstacles. Okay, so there are a lot of national narratives about what health equity is, how to define it. In Utah, we define it as the absence of avoidable health differences among groups, whether those groups are social, economic, demographic, geographic. And health equity means a fair opportunity for everyone to reach their highest health potential. And health equity is not a renaming of minority health. Okay, so now that we're kind of on the same page, or can be at least know about how we define health disparities and health equity in Utah, I'm gonna share just a little bit about our office who um, created um, this health equity framework for Utah. So the Office of Health Disparities, we are part of the Utah Department of Health, which is the state health department. And we're located in the executive director's office. And our mission is to advance health equity and reduce health disparities in Utah, um, which plays into a larger vision for all Utahns to have that fair opportunity to reach their highest health potential because health is crucial um, for well being, longevity, and economic stability. So we've been in the health equity work for um, over 15 years now in Utah. Um, and this framework is really based on um, our experiences, our experiences in running and implementing and managing programs and projects and initiatives to address health disparities, very different health disparities all across. Um, our work and relationships with vulnerable communities, we've learned a lot in partnering. Um, they've taught us so much. And then also just our efforts to build capacity in our department and also across the state of Utah. Okay, so why do we even need um, a framework for health equity? So advancing health equity requires a health equity mindset. It's not just about doing more or throwing a bunch of resources and money towards health equity. It starts with thinking differently. And this thinking in turn guides all of the strategies and actions. And with a health equity mindset, this can breed trust partnerships, judicious use of resources, and increase effectiveness and efficiency. It all starts there. Because what we see is that communities experiencing health disparities cannot and should not be burdened by unconscientious decisions or actions that use up valuable time and resources. We really, in working in health equity and working in health disparities, we really can't afford lost opportunities. We cannot burden communities already burdened by health disparities. And so this health equity mindset helps promote and guide our actions and strategies in a very conscientious way with communities and those we're trying to serve in mind. Okay, so now we are going to jump to the health equity framework. And I'm gonna go through it just one piece at a time. I actually did this presentation for my husband last night, who's um, a, an economist and works for um, an international bank. And he was like, wow, this is very intensive and a little bit overwhelming. Can you go slower when you do your presentation? So we're gonna walk you through it. Um, and I'm gonna try and go slow because this is what I'm passionate about. So I get excited about it. Um, so this will hopefully set the foundation in context. So. Okay, we're gonna start with um, our principle. And this is so foundational to um, our framework and our work. It is that health equity is a pathway. It's a pathway to better quality of life and social cohesion. 
So this means that health equity is not the end result, but it's a means, it's a pathway. It facilitates the opportunity for communities and individuals to reach their highest health potential, to be healthy, to be comfortable, to be productive, to be empowered, to enjoy life, which harkens back to um, the health value survey. And health equity really facilitates connectedness and belonging um, among communities, individuals, which we can see is so important in Utah. Okay, so again, health equity is a pathway. It's not the end, it's the means. It's the way that we get to health and health is crucial to productivity, to connectedness, belonging, to all of those values that Utahns share. So health equity really um, is a fair distribution of power and resources. So power and resources are fairly dis distributed when we have health equity. And that is a way um, that improves opportunities for communities and individuals to thrive and for healthy community conditions. And we do not see avoidable or unfair differences in health outcomes, or we don't see health disparities and that and contributes to decreased medical conditions. So that's kind of what we're looking at with health equity and that will contribute to this quality of life with social cohesion. So what is it that contributes to health equity or how do we get to health equity? So we're looking at the structural determinants of health and the social determinants of health. This is our pathway to health equity. So we're gonna start with the social determinants of health. Um, I'm not gonna dive super deep into the social determinants of health. There's another breakout session on that and this could take up the whole time because <laughs> it's so big. Um, but I will say that within the social determinants of health, there are different focuses and we group them into community and place-based determinants um, and individual-based determinants. So I'm gonna start with individual-based determinants. So um, this is when we work at mitigating social risks and addressing social needs. Um, and we're actually pretty good at this, or there are a lot of efforts around this. Um, this can look like signing individuals up for Medicaid or CHIP. It can look like providing a food box. It can look like, you know, giving a ride to a health visit or a vaccine clinic. <laughs> um, it can look like providing a list of resources. Um, it can look like a lot of different things, but this actually is a domain um, in which community health workers, and we love our community health workers, they really shine in this arena, really shine. Um, and so that's what we consider to be the individual-based determinants. And the community and place-based determinants, this is where we see the conditions in which the place um, where people live, learn, work, play, that place and those conditions promote health. So if you look here, you can see um, we have listed education, employment, income, housing, transportation, all of these different things, healthcare. Um, and so this can look like different efforts to make streets complete so that there are safe places to walk um, and get to and be physically active. It can look like safe housing. Um, so that our homes where we spend a lot of our time is safe and healthy. It can look like access to nutritious few foods, making sure that we're not just choosing to eat fruits and vegetables, but they're available um, and ready for us and that they're accessible and affordable and that there are places to be physically active, that we have parks and trails and all of these different things. It can look like all day kindergarten, um, for people to be able to work, to make money, to um, provide an income for all the different things that we need to make us healthy. It can look like workforce development and training, affordable childcare after school programs. 
Um, this is where we're seeing the social determinants of health in the community and play space. And so the social determinants of health, they contribute to opportunities and healthy community conditions, which then in turn contribute to a decrease in health disparities and decreases in medical conditions. So this can help reduce um, the burden of healthcare costs and that provides reciprocating benefits for quality of life. So you can really see these different relationships and how health is facilitated and fostered by the social determinants of health, whether that's at the community and place based level or the individual level. All right, so I'm just going to let you look at this for a little bit longer because <laughs> it can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, okay, so now we're going to move on to the structural or systems based determinants which we really pull out and differentiate from the social determinants of health in our health equity framework. So in the structural or systems-based determinants, there's a balance of power, resources, and opportunity, which advances health equity. This is the area where we consider everyone and include everyone. This is where everyone's involved regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of ability, everyone is civically engaged and participates in decisions and we're cognizant of all people, um, people who live in rural areas, people who live in urban areas, people who live in frontier communities. Um, and these are the determinants that really have gained a lot of awareness and attention recently. And so this is where um, we see addressing many of the isms lie that you've heard. Um, so some approaches in this area include, you know, implicit bias training, workforce diversity, addressing um, differences in pay among genders, um, ADA adherence, um, voter registration efforts, making sure um, we have people um, at the table from the communities that are serving so that voices are heard and, and decisions are being made with everything in mind. So the structural um, and systems-based determinants, they contribute to power and resources being distributed fairly, um, which in turn helps with opportunities to thrive and informs the social determinants of health and informs the healthy community conditions, which then again trickles down to um, decreases in health disparities, decreases in medical conditions. And this contributes to advancing economic development with social cohesion or with that connectedness and that belonging among communities. All right, hopefully that wasn't too fast, but this is our health equity framework. This is the whole thing. So again, we can see the structural or systems-based determinants of health and the social determinants of health and how those advance health equity or contribute to health equity, which in turn is a pathway to quality of life and social cohesion. All right. Um, so now I wanted to take just a few minutes to have a discussion of 10 minutes or so and get your thoughts um, and think about, you know, now that we've gone over the framework, where do you see yourself or do you see the work that you do or areas that you cover in this framework? Do you recognize an area that Utah does not concentrate on or that maybe you have never considered? Um, was there something that um, you identified that you can do differently? Or was there a way that you can shift to be more health equity minded or how this might shift your, your mindset? Um, there are no wrong answers. We're all always learning when it comes to health equity work. So feel free to um, unmute, speak up, share. Um, and I'm just gonna pull back 
um, up the health equity framework so you can reference it. I think I have someone putting in the chat these questions so that you can reference them. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, mute myself and I'll comment when you comment and we can hopefully have a discussion about where are we on working on things in Utah with this health equity framework. So here it is back up if anyone wants to share um, thoughts where um, they see themselves, things that they're learning, et cetera. Hey, Brittany. This is uh, Caitlin from Epic Program within the Department of Health. Um, one thing that I really thought was interesting on this health equity framework is calling out the structural or systems-based determinants. I hadn't seen that before and definitely something that we talk about um, but uh, never like, I guess, defined that way and being a part of this. And I think that was really cool and something that I'm gonna start focusing on in my work. So thank you. Thanks so much, Caitlin. And I know that you probably are in some ways focusing on this in your work, whether it's internally or externally, I kind of know the work you do. So I'm glad to hear that and to see that it resonated with you, awesome. Hi, Brittany. This is Trey Hurd with Comagine Health. Good morning. Thank you for such a great presentation. I love this framework and it, um, it reinforces some of the work um, that, we work uh, that we do with the Utah Department of Health and with Get Healthy Utah in scaling the National Diabetes Prevention Program in the state. Um, we're currently working on a five-year cooperative agreement with CDC that is particularly targeted to population health in Utah, we focus um, in the Hispanic and Latinx communities, as well as Native American communities. And we're in year four of this program, and we've started to see um, some really great uptake and some partnerships to, that have developed. We've also been working at, um, with work sites to be able to expand access to the National Diabetes Prevention Program. Part of what I love about National DPP is that it really puts the onus on the individual and gives some support and direction and education for an entire year to have people individually be able to um, take charge of their health and kind of learn some of those behaviors. So I can see, um, especially through our Medicaid, um, which Sarah Hodson mentioned, our Medicaid efforts to be able to expand national DPP to Medicaid beneficiaries. So I think all of that fits in really well with this health equity framework and making sure that this particular program um, is available across all different socioeconomic um, statuses throughout the state. So this is just, it's a great framework and I think national DPP fits in really nicely. Thank you so much for sharing. That's so exciting to hear and know about. Um, I think it's always important when we're doing these national um, interventions and programs to make sure that we do tailor it to Utah and see how it works in Utah. So I love that you're, you're considering that. I think that the um, support to individuals through that year long is awesome. I think we can also consider, you know, what other partners as we think about um, across in this work group across Utah that makes sure that when that individual goes out and is trying to do those things that the community and place based determinants support that and that there are systems in place for um, feedback loops for communities to be able to be involved in the decision making that place those community and place based determinants to support those um, things that they're going to be learning in that program. So I think that's that's awesome to hear about. And there's a lot of work to do to support that too. There sure is. And it just, you know, the social determinants of health have become really apparent in working with some of our priority populations, whether it be access, you know, internet access, food insecurity, um, ability to participate due to transportation or childcare issues. So yeah, it is you know, it's, it's definitely all related. Thank you. Thank you. And Brittany, this is Elisa. 
there's a few items in the chat that I just want to draw your attention to, and it dovetails in thinking about how this framework is going to maybe function as like a true north for all of us. That Mikkel Moore, the Intermountain Senior VP and Chief Community Health Officer, she also expressed appreciation for your very thoughtful explanation of this framework and fully agrees with it and cites how it aligns with Intermountain's own internal framework, but does ask a couple questions and would appreciate some responses from you about how important is it that we all buy in to this framework and will we face opposition to the framework? I love that and I, Mattel's wonderful and I appreciate that thoughtful comment and, and also very important question for discussion now and probably later too. Um, I think, yes, we have always faced opposition in trying to advance health equity, um, whether it's a framework or the work that we do. Um, but I think, I think that's the, the point of the framework is to um, help everyone see where we're coming from, what we're trying to do, and help everyone find their place in this part. And it's going to take a lot of partners, and we're going to have to address that um, opposition or pushback whenever we, we face it and find it. So definitely, um, and we'll need everyone on board to be able to address it. So thanks for that, Mikkel. That was a really good we probably need to have a discussion about that later or a work group or another meeting about that. So awesome. Well, thank you, Brittany. And I'm I'm happy to be a partner. You know, maybe it's important and valuable that we all adopt the same framework and uh, happy to consider how we can be mutually supportive of one another in that. Thanks. We'll give just a couple more minutes for anyone else who wants to share where they see themselves or something that was interesting or different or how this might help you think differently. Um, we'd love to hear about it. So just a couple more minutes before we move on. Hey, Brittany, this is Laurie Stringham with Salt Lake County Council. I don't know if you guys can hear me. <laughs> yes, we can. I always do that too. Can you actually hear me? <laughs> Sometimes my sound isn't the greatest. Um, one of the things that I wanted to bring up that I find kind of interesting, I come from a little bit different background maybe than some that are here, because I don't actually work per se in the areas that you guys do on programs and things outside of just parks and recreation out in our area. But one of the things I do see as a teacher, because I teach high school, we deal with equity all the time as far as education goes, but not so much health. I mean, there are some health equity programs in schools the food programs and things that come in, but there, I think it could be a better resource than what we're using currently. The other thing I see is our parks and recreation departments could be a much better resource for a lot of these programs as well than they're currently used. And um, our churches, um, I, I live out on the west side. I'm a single mom, I live in Kearns. Um, I am in an area that's exactly what we're talking about. And it's interesting to, to me that I hear a lot about this specifically from programs and groups. And I see a few things going on, but I don't ever see anything that really is large where it just seems to make a huge change. And those are kind of, what big projects, what big things could we do that would make a, a sweeping change that may, might be low lying fruit that we could really focus on um, being able to bring some of this, um, some more equity to different areas of Salt Lake County or, and in Utah specifically. Um, sorry, I didn't catch your name at the beginning, but you are my new best friend because you have probably more expertise on lived experience and health equity than any of us. And what you're saying is just amazing. You understand it. You get it intuitively. You don't have to be taught it by my presentation in any way. Um, and so I love that you're, you're saying exactly what needs to happen is we need bigger change. We need um, all of these different connections. Your work what you were saying contributes completely to health equity. It might not be labeled health equity work or have this very dis distinct direct, <laughs> you know, it does. But um, so at the Office of Health Disparities, that's what we're looking at in the next um, 
a little bit is to see what we can do and what we can pull together. And that's what the governor's um, One Utah Roadmap is. There's a focus on developing a health equity plan for the state of Utah. So more to come. I appreciate, yes, to hear that, yes, we do need this and we will take that um, back to all the stakeholders um, and that you should definitely be a part of these conversations to form them and um, share your, your expertise. So thank you so much for speaking up. Um, that was amazing to hear. Okay, I am... Hey, Brittany. Oh, yep. And you, sorry, my, my name is Shivan Wagon, and I'm with the Wasatch Front Regional Council. And um, hearing Council Member um, Stringham speak there, and, and just looking at the framework a little bit, you know, it all can feel pretty overwhelming. I think was a, a word that was used earlier, right? How do we tackle education, employment, income, housing, gaps in political power, sort of all at the same time, right? And um, and working in the transportation field. Um, and knowing that it has a lot of interconnected interconnectedness with several of these things, <clears throat> um, I will mention uh, that that Kearns is um, about to kick off an active transportation plan effort uh, that's led by the MSD. Um, and so, you know, there are um, certain certain things that can happen uh, that can get at certain portions of this, right? And um, I think it's probably helpful to recognize uh, what you've said, but recognize there are several different um, agencies, departments, individuals working in these various areas and um, all trying to recognize where people are doing good work so that we don't all feel that we have to tackle everything that's listed here, um, uh, but, but being coordination and communication uh, to not duplicate efforts, but to support one another as Mikkel was saying earlier. Um, so um, things like active transportation plans in communities, uh, executing those plans, creating events around those plans. And when I say active transportation, for those that aren't familiar, uh, biking and walking, making that easier um, and an easier choice to not only recreate, but to move from place to place. Um, so you can, people can build in uh, a little bit of movement into their everyday lives um, for places they're going anyways, you know, and, you know, what does that mean? There are a lot of um, parts to that, but um, anyway, so in current specifically, Council Member Stringham, that, that effort is um, taking off soon. So something to, to be aware of. Hugh, did you know my the next slide of my presentation? I'm just wondering. <laughs> you know, we'll get to that in a, in a little bit. But thank you so much for sharing. Thanks. Um, okay, we're going to keep going um, really quickly. I hope this works. I don't. Okay, there we go. Um, so really quickly, I just wanted to provide just a very brief snapshot at some strategic practices. Um, so these are strategic practices for advancing health equity, which can seem overwhelming. So this helps us kind of delineate it and kind of focus our efforts. Um, and so I'm not going to go over every single practice. This is a national framework. It's wonderful, but there are strategic practices for building internal infrastructure to advance health equity, um, for working across agencies um, and partnering, because that has to happen, um, for fostering community partners and for championing transformative change. So I just wanted to share briefly just a little bit of the work that we've been doing um, for building internal infrastructure. So we're currently working on the standardization of race ethnicity data, um, which is important to make sure that we are standardized in the way that we collect it, we report it, we analyze it so that we can get a true picture of racial and ethnic health disparities in Utah. Um, we're developing a training on health equity so we can build the understanding of um, the workforce um, and the programs that are working on health equity. Um, for working across agencies, we've developed an internal Utah Department of Health Health Equity Work Group, which has different um, representatives across our department so that we can try and work on advancing health equity as the department and being coordinated. Um, we also sit on the Multicultural Commission, which has a lot of different agencies. Um, for fostering community partnerships, one of the things that we've been working on for the past year is the COVID Community Partnership, which is a collaborative of community health workers. So we talked about how community health workers are really good at working and providing access to social needs and the social determinants of health. 
Um, and then for championing transformative change, we have, of course, created the health equity framework and are trying to share it. And like Mikel had mentioned earlier, hopefully we can align around it. So um, those are just a few things. But what I wanted to share next was, oh my gosh, yes, health equity work can seem overwhelming and possible and something really hard to move. <laughs> um, so how do we take on such a big task? Um, you know, there's a story of a group of people trying to move a piano down some stairs and into another room. Um, none of them were professionals or had professional moving equipment. And they tried a bunch of different ways to try and move this piano, which is actually a pretty delicate task. Um, and finally, they did find a solution. What they did is they stood close together all around the piano. And all they did was they lifted where they stood and they did it together. And I think the same is true with health equity work. Um, we all have a place in that framework. We all have a place in health equity work. Um, and we can lift where we stand and move it together. But I think also important is not just lifting where we stand and lifting together, but it's how we do it. Um, so there was a research experiment back in the 70s that was looking at rabbits. And it looked at what a... Um, high fat diet would do to heart health. Um, and the results overall were as expected. Um, many of us could have guessed this now too, was that um, there was a buildup of fatty deposits um, on the arteries. But for researchers, there was a result that was surprising and kind of off-putting, that there was one group of rabbits that had up to 60% less of the buildup than others. And this was just completely puzzling <laughs> to this group. How, how did this happen? What did we do wrong? They reviewed all of their research protocols, looked for everything, couldn't find anything. And then finally, they realized that there was this one commonality among all of these rabbits. And it was that they had the same researcher administering the, the food to them. And she, you know, fed the rabbits like everyone else, but one of the scientists reported that this researcher was unusually kind and caring. Um, and that when she fed the rabbits, she talked to them, she cuddled them, she petted them, she massaged them, and she couldn't help doing that. It's just how she was. And so what she did was she did more than simply give the rabbits food. And I think it's so important, especially in thinking about health, is that it's not just important that we lift where we stand, it's the way in which we lift and the way in which we do our work. So advancing health equity, it begins with the approach that you take and the way you execute work, not just the fact that you're doing it. But also <laughs> we have to realize that we have to be flexible and willing to change what we do and how we do it because, oh my gosh, working in health disparities and health equity is an exercise in um, navigating uncharted territory. It really is. And uncertainty um, is just inevitable. And so how do we do this? Um, I don't know if you knew this, I didn't, um, but airplanes are off course about 90% of the time. Yet, I'm sure of all the flights you've been on, most of them land in the destination that they're supposed to go to, and they usually land on time, sometimes even early, um, but they do. And how is this even possible? Well, the pilots are constantly course correcting, constantly and quickly too. Without that, you can end up in the wrong destination, arrive at the wrong time. You can also have disaster occur. So a while back, there was a small airplane with less than 300 people that was going from New Zealand to Antarctica on a sightseeing tour, you know, and at some point their flight path was off by like two, de two degrees, just two degrees, you know, 
which ended up placing them in the path of an active volcano. And there was a series of unfortunate events, but the plane crashed and everyone died. Um, which it was just two degrees and all of these people lost their lives. Um, it's so sad. Um, and I think this quote is so important that small things, if not corrected, and I would add corrected quickly, become big things always. And so in our work, we do need to lift where we stand and we do need to all work together. And it's important the way in which we do things in health equity work. But what's also important is that we're flexible, that we adapt quickly, that we have feedback loops and that we are constantly course correcting because I mean, health disparities, and we haven't gotten health equity. It's for a reason. It's hard, <laughs> you know, but it's important. Um, and if we do it together and we work together and we're constantly learning, we can gain ground, even if it's just incrementally. Um, but it can impact everyone here in Utah for the better. And so um, the more determinants that are addressed, the more comprehensive the health equity approach. So that's why we need everyone who's in this health equity framework to work together. Um, we need people working in individual-based, community-based, based, systems, and structural-based. I used to think like, oh my gosh, we only need to work on the structural because that's the most important. It's not all of these are important, and we do need a comprehensive approach. And so the more comprehensive the health equity approach, the more opportunities individuals can have to be healthy, productive, and empowered. We can reach that goal. Health equity can become that pathway to Utahns being healthy, productive, empowered. Um, so that's kind of what I had to share. I think we have three or four minutes left for questions and discussion. I can't remember exactly the time we're supposed to be back to the um, session, but I'm sure Elise will help us that. So thank you so much for being here. Um, and please, again, put your information in the chat so we can connect because there's lots and lots of work to do. I want to allow for anyone to jump in with any comments or questions in our final minutes. You're correct, Brittany, that we do want to rejoin here in a couple minutes, but just a huge thank you to you and all the preparation. You can tell your husband you nailed it. <laughs> so uh, very much appreciate. Um, it was noted in the chat. Others commented the passion and it's contagious through Zoom. So I can't imagine what it's like in person, but also the depth of expertise as demonstrated. Thank you for establishing nomenclature and definitions around these terms on walking through this comprehensive health equity framework and then some various strategic practices, but then ending where you did on really funneling down to the individual level of having it resonate, at least for me, and I know probably others can speak to this emotionally, internally. And so a takeaway for me personally is something you noted at the beginning of what happens to some of us happens to all of us. And it's happening to me, it's happening to my family. And so when I think about the health equity framework and a takeaway is we all, we're, we're believers on this call, <laughs> but it's still making a personal choice to own this work and find your place in it within that framework, lift where you're standing, find a way to do it, like you said, that's needed by those that you are doing the intervention among. Connect with them and, just, and learn what is most meaningful and valuable to them around this health equity. And Figure out where your work intersects along this pathway of cultivating better health, better quality of life. And I just, again, that's my takeaway and something tangible to within my own circles, start to socialize and ask of, you know, think about it. What can you lean into and really make a decision to own as part of this and think differently 